In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we continue this journey, this journey of anticipation and preparation to the celebration of Christ's birth, the nativity of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ according to the flesh. That's the full church name for that feast. And as we have been looking at in these weeks leading up to this point, we have been reviewing the preparation for that primarily looking at stories from the life of the Mother of God before this has happened. And so we are continuing on that path. And so just to kind of mark where we are and what we have to anticipate, uh, this morning we will talk about the Annunciation. The Mother of God finding out that she will be the Mother of God. And then a week from today, we will have our Sunday morning service, which is the Sunday before Nativity, liturgically. And we will look at Joseph learning about the Mother of God becoming the Mother of God. And then next week, Sunday evening, we will have our Nativity service proper. And that will be the story of what we've been preparing for. Christ's birth. The entrance of God into history. where we're going. Where have we been? Well, let's recall some of the things that we've been looking at up to this point. First of all, we looked at the story of the birth of the Mother of God to Joachim and Anna, and how they, learning that they would have a child after praying for that, said that they would dedicate this child to the service of God. How she was brought up in her younger years in a place of holiness within their household set apart from everyone else. And then when she was three, presented to the temple in Jerusalem. And she lived within the precincts of the temple until she was 12. And then as we heard last week, she could no longer stay in the temple, but the desire to have her remain dedicated to God. She was betrothed to the widower Joseph. So it's an engagement, not a marriage yet. But he, she could live under his roof as his betrothed and be cared for. And so that brings us to where we are today. So this story of the mother of God finding out that she would be the mother of God is commonly called the Annunciation. The announcement, as it were. The birth announcement. So she had been living at the household of Joseph as his betrothed. They had still had this idea of a delayed wedding. Uh, he was an older widower, had other children, and of course worked as a carpenter. And his carpentry work was essentially in building homes. And so as a first century contractor, he would often be gone for weeks and months at a time, out in other communities, building houses. And so during this time, there was a decision at the temple in Jerusalem. You know, things wear out. And so the high priest had said, we need a new curtain to hang between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the space in the church. And we need to uh, gather uh, eight virgins, as it were, to prepare this curtain from scratch. So spinning the cloth, weaving the fabric, making you know, the large piece. And so because they were remembered at the temple, Mary, who was dedicated to God, she could be included in that group. And so she was at home working on this curtain. Have a little, uh, it's not really a digression. I use the word excursus. This is related, and it's something that touches on the themes that we have here. Of course, uh, we are still in the process of, of uh, working on the permanence of what happens up here. So our iconostase is temporary. And so there are certain features that we don't have on our iconostase at this point. 
Uh, two of them are doors, so there should be doors on either side here uh, to come in and out of. And then, of course, the royal doors here in the front and a curtain. Talk a little bit about the curtain. The curtain is modeled after that curtain in the Holy of Holies. Now there's an interesting theological difference. The curtain for the Holy of Holies essentially functioned as a wall. It was a piece of fabric, but it's not a curtain that was opened or shut. It was always shut. And as I've shared in past homilies, the only time anyone was supposed to go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest once a year. People didn't go back then. So we have a difference in terms of what we have with our divine liturgy. That curtain that we will have here is like that curtain of the Holy of Holies, but it's open and shut all the time. When there's not a church service, it is shut. And depending upon what service you're serving and what's happening in that service, the curtain is open or shut. What we'll typically see is on divine liturgies, Sunday mornings, it's open and it stays open. At the end of liturgy, it's shut. And there's something that's said in that. And there's something very important. And it touches on this idea of the work that Christ did. When else do we hear about the curtain? When do we hear of the curtain in the Gospels? We hear about it on Great and Holy Friday, the story of the crucifixion. When Christ dies, one of the things that we hear about is that that curtain in the temple is ripped in half. We can read that with a great dramatic effect. All these things happened. It, it was you know, the curtain ripped, there were earthquakes, um, the dead rose from the tombs, all of these things. And we can read, read that as very dramatic Hollywood sorts of stuff in telling that story of the crucifixion. But the point in hearing that that curtain was ripped in half, and it's interesting, it says it's from the top to the bottom. It's a 30 foot high curtain. How can it be ripped from the top? You can imagine someone at the bottom trying to like pull it apart and ripping it bottom to top. But it's saying that it's an act of God, ripping that curtain in half. And it's making the statement that division between the Holy of Holies and the people is not permanent. I think what else happens in our divine liturgy? Open curtain. We can consider this the Holy of Holies. We'll, we will see this in a little bit in communion. We see that the body and blood of Christ are present in that chalice at communion. And the priest brings it out. The presence of God comes in your midst. No longer is it kept behind a curtain and locked away. It's all interesting stuff there. <clears throat> Two final things. Go back to the doors. Royal doors. There are a few different things that can be put on the royal doors that are, are here. But the normative thing, and the most common thing, is an icon of this feast. You know, it's two doors, usually about waist height, maybe a little higher. Archangel Gabriel is typically on one door, looking at the Mother of God. And the Mother of God is here, listening. So it's saying that the announcing of God coming and His presence in your midst, like we experience in communion. And often there's a detail. So if you ever see an icon of the Annunciation, look at the hands of the Mother of God. Usually she has in her right hand a spool of thread. And that's pointing to the story of her, you know, the backdrop. She is making this curtain for the temple. Okay, that's the excursus. Let's go back to the narrative. So we hear that Mary is in the midst of being at home, working on this curtain. And the Archangel Gabriel appears to her. And the inane angel makes this announcement. He says, Rejoice. You've essentially been chosen to be the mother of the Savior, Christ. And 
this is something that is being presented to you. What's often lost in this is sometimes it can be presented as just a mechanism. And things are kind of going along and things just happen. So Angel shows up, basically gives the mother of God her job, and says, okay, this is going to happen to you, prepare for it, and move along. But as with all things in our lives, as people created with free will, created with free will, she chose them. So if we read this narrative, this is kind of the thing. A lot of what I've been saying has been from this Proto-Evangelium of James. The Annunciation story, a lot of the content for that is in chapter 2 of the Gospel of Luke. And her response to the angel's message is, Be it unto me according to your word. She agrees to it. So, she chooses to be the mother of God. And so, at that point, she is a mother of a child by the work of the Holy Spirit. The angel makes this other point. And essentially says, well, you're here alone. Joseph is off building houses somewhere. Why don't you go stay and stay with your cousin, Elizabeth? She's likewise pregnant. And so the narrative switches. It goes from the mother of God being at home receiving this message to going to visit her cousin. Let me fill in a little more detail here. Elizabeth is the wife of Zacharias, the high priest. So we're connecting some dots here. And she is six months pregnant. And the child she is pregnant with is St. John the Forerunner. So something that we understand here is uh, cousins. Christ and St. John are cousins. So imagine, if you will, and there are some icons with this, where they'll show the two of them meeting and embracing. And they highlight their wounds with little children in them. And we hear that as Mary approaches and meets her cousin Elizabeth at her house, that the baby, John, leaps in her womb. And this is foreshadowing the responsibility that John has later. And it is time for Jesus Christ as an adult to begin his ministry. The forewarning, the one that goes before, the one who calls attention to, prepare, one greater than I is coming. His leaping in the womb is recognizing that he's in the presence of God. In that baby Jesus. And so, Elizabeth likewise has this recognition. And she makes this statement. We hear it in our prayers. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She recognizes that there is something holy going on. Now I'm doing this a little bit for memory. But what sums up this story is a hymn that the mother of God sings. In the West it's called the Magnificat. And traditionally in Western liturgical traditions, it's sung at their Vesper service. For us as Orthodox Christians, we call it the magnifications. And thematically, it works best in our Orthodox service. So if you come to the service before this, every Sunday, about two-thirds of the way through the service, this hymn is sung. So you know, thematically, we have this thing. Orthodox is kind of the preparation for the coming of Christ. The liturgy is Christ present. And so it hearkens to that. So she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And it goes on from there. And it's all of these things about the blessing she has received in becoming the mother of God. And the work that he will do in saving the world and all that are within it. And kind of a crowning part of that hymn, there are two parts during the Orthodox service when I sense the entire church. That's the second one, so I'll come out 
And while the chanters are doing that hymn, I'm sensing the entire church pointing in that direction. So Mary has received this message. Mary is with child by the power of the Holy Spirit. And she is spending time at the house of her cousin, Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Forerunner. And she'll remain for another three months there until Elizabeth gives birth to John. And then she'll return home. And so next week, we get to hear the story of, well, what happens when she gets home and Joseph comes home and finds out that she is with child. Now, I'll pull this together. One last thing. This story this morning, we celebrate in the church the Annunciation. This is one of the principal feasts of the Mother of God. Um, and we celebrate it every year, March 25th. Do the math. Add nine months. March 25th, nine months more, December 25th. We kind of do that with the timing as well. And what's interesting is the next day, March 26th, there's like a miniature feast tacked on. The Archangel Gabriel. He's honored in that as well. Nine times out of ten, well, ten times out of ten, this feast of the Annunciation occurs during Great Lent. And one of the special things about it is, during the Lent season, on weekdays, we do not offer liturgies. We have pre-sanctified liturgies with elements that were consecrated the Sunday before, but it is not normal to celebrate liturgy on weekdays of Great Lent. This is one exception. This one is celebrated. Now, the tricky thing we have to look forward to is this year the feast falls on the Monday after the Sunday of Orthodoxy. So it's kind of bumping into some other things there. We'll figure that out when we get there. So next Sunday morning, Joseph discovering what has happened and how that plays out. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen.